Hey guys, I'm Mark, and today I wanted to put together a video to talk about a couple cultural things that you really want to pay attention to when you're growing tomatoes, especially this time of year at this stage. Uh, I've got a lot of customers that come into the greenhouse and they show me pictures of their tomato plants and they, there's some sort of disease or fungus or something's wrong with them. The fruit are misshapen and, uh, and a lot of times people think it's because they got the wrong variety or because they're feeding them the wrong thing. And yes, those things are important, um, but nine times out of 10, it seems to me that the most, prob the most problems that people have are attributed to one thing. And that one thing is basically how this plant interacts with water. So I'm gonna do a video talking about how this plant interacts with water above the surface of the soil and how this plant interacts with water below the surface of the soil and why it's so important. Because if you get one of those things off or both of those things off, then you can wind up with serious problems down the road. Uh, so to start off, basically, Airflow, airflow, airflow. That is the number one thing, I guess, if I had to pick um, to, to suggest to people something that they want to focus on is airflow, getting a good circulation around this plant, getting it dried off right away. And that is because a lot of the issues that we seem to have, at least in this area with tomato plants, have to do with either uh, fungal problems or bacterial uh, problems. And it doesn't really matter a whole lot which is which. I mean, sometimes even experts have a difficult time distinguishing the difference between the two, or at least identifying them. Um, but from a, from a cultural standpoint, they both thrive under the same conditions. So you can see uh, to my right here is an Ananas Noir tomato plant. It's an excellent tomato plant. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a little more temperamental. It's not one for beginners, but, um, but it's certainly uh, one of my favorites for flavor. Uh, this tomato plant, looking at it at face value, it looks really healthy. Everything looks great about it. There's no red flags or concerns uh, other than what could be coming down the line. You can see all this foliation, all, this, uh, all these leaves go all the way down to the ground here. And there's, there's a lot of deep, dark, shadowy spaces in there. And as this plant gets larger, that situation is only going to get more dense. There's not going to be much airflow going on down there. And what it's going to do is it's going to be a good place for funguses or fungi, excuse me, and uh, bacteria to sort of take hold and start. They like, you know, bacteria and fungi, they like those nice, warm, moist conditions. That's where they're going to thrive. Um, so you got to picture your situation, what it is. Um, it may be more important for you to prune if you're in an area, let's say you have a house that's like in the woods and your tomatoes don't get sunlight until like noon, okay? Well, that, that's a situation where it's, it's essential that you need to get a lot of your foliage uh, cleared out of the way, especially down low on the plant so that that plant can breathe. Uh, the longer, you know, tomatoes, tomatoes, most plants in general, they don't mind being wet, but they don't like to stay wet. Uh, so it's important to get the plant dried off, especially first thing in the morning as early as possible after all the, uh, the evening dew um, sits on there all night long. Uh, so what I'll do, at least what I'm going to do this year, um, I didn't do this last year because I, I do culturally this garden. It does sit out in a lot of sun. It's got a lot of airflow. There's, there's, uh, there's grass and pasture in all directions. Um, so in general, these tomato plants, um, just by the way that their situation is, is they do get a good bit of airflow, but that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna wind up with problems either. Um, last year, I did wind up having some, some blight issues low down. Uh, our issues, my issues would be just the same as most other people. You start seeing spots and speckles low down and then they start to just rise up the plant and up the plant and up the plant. Uh, most most uh, fungal and bacterial diseases work that way. A lot of fungal diseases, the way they work is when rain comes down through the plant, they will splash to the soil surface and they'll kick up spores and those spores will make contact with the first thing would be the lowest leaves. And then they start to grow on those nice, wet, damp leaves. And then they flower again or they fruit again and send off spores again to the, to the leaves above it. And it just works its way all the way up the plant until basically, eventually, all the lower branches will be stripped of leaves anyway. Uh, and then you'll notice once you get to that point, once the plant loses all of its leaves from like here down and then temperatures start getting cooler again, the plant's got a lot of airflow now because it lost a lot of its leaves. Then you start to see it sort of green up again and get healthier going into the fall. Uh, at least that's kind of uh, the, the situation that I see happening a lot around here. So what I'm going to do anyway, what I'm going to do this year is I'm going to defoliate this plant all the way down, um, starting, starting from here 
This bar right here is gonna be like my frame of reference. I, uh, I did make a video on how I made these cages, by the way, I love them. But anyway, this, this bar right here is about 18 inches above the ground, maybe uh, 18, 20, 16 to 20, somewhere in there. And uh, that, that's gonna be my, my mark of where I'm gonna remove all these leaves all the way down the base of the plant, every single one of them, until eventually it's gonna look something like this tomato plant over here to my left. That is a early girl tomato plant. That's a fantastic tomato for beginners. Um, it's not very temperamental at all. You can throw it anywhere, but um, any, to plant, any tomato plant, I don't care what it is, if you don't give it enough airflow, uh, it's gonna have some problems later on. But you can see I've removed everything all the way up to here. Uh, when you do this, something to pay attention to is that you can see I've got all this exposed, low-hanging fruit right now. And uh, the only issue that I think it could get posed here by virtue of me removing all these lower branches is that now these tomatoes might get sun scald a little bit because just yesterday they were in this thick, dense foliage that was shading them out and um, they're, they're just, they had no need to really toughen up. So uh, if you're gonna do this, a cloudy day is a good day to do it because that almost sort of allows the tomatoes or whatever delicate parts to kind of acclimate to, uh, to the full-blown sunshine. Like you don't wanna like take them out of the shade and then go directly out in a full-blown hot sun. Um, that's gonna be the case with, with a lot of plants. In fact, down at the nursery, uh, when we're moving certain things out of a greenhouse outside, if, if depending upon what it is, we might only want to move it out on a cloudy day because uh, it just gives them, the sunlight is more intense outside than it is in the greenhouse. So when you, when you pick a cloudy day to move them out, it gives them just a little bit more time to acclimate uh, and you get less sun scorch uh, that way. But even if these do get sun scorched, um, that's, that's okay. It's worth it in the long run because the tomato plant as a whole is going to benefit. Uh, besides removing the lower leaves, you can also take your time while you're down here to, uh, to start plucking out some things that are just unnecessary, I guess. The whole theory about, you know, grow tomatoes, not leaves or anything else. Um, you want the plant to dedicate its energy into what you want it to dedicate its energy into. So when you're down here looking around, um, remove any like little, any abnormal looking tomatoes that have like some cat facing going on or something like that. Stuff that, you know, I, I want this plant to uh, put its energy into the really nice looking tomatoes, because why not? There's going to be enough of them. Um, so search those guys out, remove any, uh, remove any unwanted fruit before it starts getting too big and the plant wastes too much energy on it. Uh, people say to remove the suckers. I do here and there. Um, if it's small enough and it's low enough down, uh, I don't really have an example here to show you because I already took them all off. But uh, let me see. Okay. Here's what I mean by a sucker. You can see, uh, well, heck, I'll just cut it off to show you. So you can see, here's your tomato branch. You have your main leaf stem coming off, and you can see this is the, this is the main branch of the tomato. It goes up. This is the branch that's gonna produce a lot more flowers in the end. It's gonna, it's gonna have a more direct route. Um, this guy in the middle right here, in between the leaf, in, in, in this union right here, that's the sucker. So if I was gonna prune this branch, let's say this branch was down low, I'm gonna get rid of that leaf and I'm gonna get rid of that sucker. And, uh, and I'm just gonna leave the rest of it to, uh, to climb up. But you know, I don't get all carried away about removing every sucker and, and all that kind of stuff. I just sort of basically focus on, um, if nothing else, having good airflow through this plant and just keeping things nice and dry. If there are any spores that kick up, they'll hit onto something, they'll, they'll, they'll make contact with it and the leaf will be, they'll say, ha ha, I don't care. I mean, I'm already dry, so you can't really do anything here. And it's just, uh, you know, I guess it just falls off or goes on its merry way, something happens, but it's not gonna infect the tomato plant like it would over here. Uh, when you're pruning, I also wanted to mention um, these shears that I use. I've been, I've been taking cuttings and whatnot these are just regular florist shears. Um, they come, they, a bunch of different companies make them. They're nice because they're spring loaded. Uh, these are stainless steel. I think I paid like $13 for these online. I don't know the specific brand. I don't think it's printed on here, but um, you know, they're a dime a dozen, but they're very nice for pruning tomato plants because it's easy to navigate them in and amongst and through the plant. If you had like big scissors or something that's got like this big curly handles on them you know they're a lot more bulky and it, it's hard to like kind of sneak into things if I wanted to I mean I can I can hold these guys like all the way out like this 
and just really kind of sneak up in there and, and, and take uh, cuts. So it's very, very nice and very, um, very easy to work with. Uh, another thing, when you are pruning, you're gonna wanna make sure that you sanitize often. Uh, before I do a lot of pruning, I always wash my pruners with soap and water really well. And then also it's important that periodically as you go, uh, what I do from tomato plant to tomato plant, once I'm done with one, I'll give it a quick shot of hand sanitizer. And that way, if there's anything going on inside this plant, like a virus of some kind, that's mainly what I'm uh, concerned about, is if there were a virus in this plant, I'm not transmitting it to that plant over there right away by virtue of just having a, you know, a contaminated um, uh, pruning uh, implements. So bottle of hand sanitizer works great. You can use alcohol, you can use a bunch of different things, but the concept is basically don't, don't cross contaminate your tomato plants with, uh, with something that might be lurking, uh, lurking somewhere in there you haven't noticed yet. And that's, that's something that you wanna use. That, that's a concept you wanna do with uh, any kind of pruning really. Um, that's a good habit that we like to get ourselves into down at the nursery, especially because when we're doing cuttings and things and we're doing thousands and hundreds, I mean, you can get away, you can get, you know, several hundred in, um, you know, if you haven't cleaned somewhere in there, then, well, that's several hundred plants that you just infected. So a uh, huge deal for us is to periodically clean our, our uh, cutting implements. So anyway, that is how uh, I look at how the, um, the tomato plant interacts with water above the surface of the soil and why it's so important uh, to get airflow and, and dry things out. Uh, now I wanted to also talk about how this plant interacts with water below the soil surface. Uh, basically, mulch. Mulch, mulch, mulch. You got, we did airflow, airflow, airflow. Now I want to talk about mulch, mulch, mulch. Uh, mulch is basically anything that you use to cover the soil with. It could be shredded leaves, grass clippings, straw, uh, wood chips. Um, there's a bunch of different natural mulches. You can use plastic mulches, um, especially if you're using drip irrigation. You can use a solid black sheet. A lot of, you'll see a lot of farmers do that. Um, mulch is just, it's just super important to cover the soil and help keep moisture in, keep weeds out. Um, but if anything, super, what's most important about it is just keeping the moisture in, keeping the moisture in and keeping it consistent. Uh, again, I, I prefer to use um, annual mulches or annual natural mulches. I call them annual mulches because they sort of break down within the course of a year and you can either, you know, remove them fairly easily or just till them in. Uh, grass clippings work wonderfully because they're actually, they're a source of nitrogen as they break down. They're pretty high in that. Um, and then uh, they also, they also serve a good habitat for spiders. Uh, spiders love grass clippings and straw in particular. So that's an added benefit of using, of using these guys here. Uh, wood chips, you can see, I don't know if you saw the bed behind me. Well, you can sort of see over here. I am using wood chips on this bed as sort of a comparison. I want to see how this bed fares next to this bed. I've got some of the same varieties. Well, I've got some of the same varieties over there that I have wood chips in and then the next one, but I kind of, I put wood chips on this one just to keep things uniform and symmetrical, just some crazy stuff. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna see what the difference is with using wood chips and uh, sort of get my feet wet with it because before I start covering everything in wood chips, which is more of a perennial mulch, a mulch that's gonna stick around for more than one season, I wanna make sure that um, I got everything just right, macro, micronutrients. I, I just don't wanna cover up the, the soil uh, semi-permanently until I get really kind of familiar with it and see what happens. So uh, anyway, that's a little test over there with that. Uh, but keeping the moisture level in is critical. Uh, that's, a, that's a big thing that I see with people uh, cracking uh, main issue. That has to do with inconsistent water levels in the soil more often than not. You, uh, you'll see cracking happen right after a rainstorm if it hasn't rained in a while. So, uh, so by keeping the mulch down, that keeps levels very, very consistent. What you'll see in the middle here is this area has not been mulched yet. That's because I just pruned it. Basically, the way this all worked out was I planted my tomatoes. It's been bare ground for a while. They got big enough that I went ahead and put my cages around, and then I went and laid my mulch down. And now, since I pruned below, now I'm going to start mulching underneath here and covering up this bare soil because, uh, number one, to keep that moisture level in like I was talking about, and then number two, uh, to keep some of those spores that are living in the soil from splashing up and getting on any of the rest of the plant. But when I, want, when I do this, this is an extremely important thing. 
is you don't want to get your mulch right up against the base of the plant. You want to stay away from it a good three, four, even five inches, enough that once rain and wind start to hit it and some of these things shift around a little bit, that you don't have this big clump of grass right up against your tomato plant stem because that can start to rot it off right at base. I mean, it'll rot it right in half. Uh, so that's something very critical you want to pay attention to. And really, any when you're mulching any kind of plant, really, you don't want to have it you don't want to have any kind of mulch touching the crown of the plant. Trees, you see that? It's a big thing. People, I see people kill their trees all the time by putting these big rings of mulch around the tree and they lump it right up. The, they start going up the tree in the bark and it just causes all sorts of issues. Uh, so when you're mulching pretty much anything, I'd say when you're mulching anything, stay away from the crown. There are a few exceptions, but not many. Um, so anyway, I'm going to cover that up. Uh, before I do that, I might do a little bit of last minute amendments. Uh, I might put down a little bit of calcium just to, uh, just to assist with fighting away any kind of blossom end rot issues. Tomatoes don't seem to shy away from having too much calcium. Uh, I'm going to use lime in my case because it's so, it's very inexpensive. Uh, you could use oyster shells, you could use eggshells, things like that. Tomatoes love that kind of stuff. Uh, if you have some coffee grounds or something you want to sprinkle on there to attract some worms up before you cover it over, you know, that's all cool too. Uh, but I'm going to mulch this over. I'm going to leave it just like that. I'm never going to water it. I do not water my tomato plants. That's a big thing for me. Uh, I water them right away as soon as they get planted and then I don't touch them uh, because basically I want this tomato plant to force a root down as far as it can go. I want it to find the water. I don't want it to get it used to me coming out here every morning and spraying the surface of the soil with a hose and have it depending on that because there might be some days where I don't come out here and the, in the very top uh, soil column might get start to get relatively dry, but the, the tomato has learned to grow all of its roots out there, you know, near the surface because that's usually where the water is. So my theory is, and I've talked to uh, several people about this who I, uh, who I trust, and uh, they, they seem to concur that when you just allow the roots to really go deep, that's how you wind up getting a much more resilient plant. And you also, I've heard this too, I don't, I don't really know enough to, uh, to say for certain, but uh, the theory makes sense to me that when you have tomato roots that go real super deep, they'll start to pick up the flavors of the geology of the local, uh, of, your, of your environment, sort of like wine. Like when you drink wine, you could have wine from a vineyard that's, that's located just 10 miles away from another, not from another vineyard, but the, the grapes will taste different based upon the different, uh, you know, different kinds of rock and minerals that are in the soil. And uh, tomatoes uh, apparently, according to a lot of people, work the same way. Uh, so that's, that's just a little bit about how that works. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start pruning a whole lot more tomatoes. I've got, like I said, 112 that I got to do. I've got about two and a half beds done so far. I'm just going to work my way through the ones that really need it more so than the other ones. I'm going to start with the ones that are really, really big. I got some in here that are just are getting sort of out of control and they're getting pretty hefty and I want to get this done before they get a whole lot more size to them like the cherry tomato varieties and things like that that actually get you know really huge this is actually a variety that gets really big this is an early girl this is a this is a this winds up being a pretty substantial plant in the end it's actually sort of small of a specimen um, this particular one I would think that this one would be a little bit bigger than this at this stage but anyway looks like it's gonna have a lot of fruit on it so that's really all I care about um, so that's my video on tomatoes, the be about the two most critical things that I recommend to people when it comes to uh, things that can enhance your success greatly. Mulch, 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 and airflow. So anyways, thank you guys so much for watching my video. I hope you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one.